So I learned something important this week. When you're as big as I am, it's not a good idea to try and slide across the table because it might collapse on you. My leg is killing me now, so. <laughs> Much better today, but boy, I tell you, Friday, oh, it was in a lot of pain. <clears throat> good evening. It is good to see everybody tonight, and uh, I know we are short in numbers, but that's okay because you're here with us, and we are glad to see you tonight. It is always uplifting to my heart to see each and every one of you, so thank you for coming out and spending time with us and worshiping God with us together. In order for a group of people to gather and meet on a regular basis, there has to be something that brings them together. That's what we're going to look at tonight, this idea of what brings us together. What is it that keeps this body together? What is it that holds us and sustains us? And what is it that's going to keep us together in the future? Now, you might have some ideas already and can think about some things, but I want to touch a little bit deeper than some of the thoughts of just saying, well, we're together because we're in like-mindedness, or we're together because we're all children of God. When you think about your friends and the people you spend time with, who are those people? Who do you hang out with? Do you hang out with people that don't think anything like you? Or do you hang out with people that have a like-mindedness to the things that you like to think about or the things that you like to do? <clears throat> what kind of people do you gravitate towards? Do you look at people that agree with your way of thinking? Do we choose people that, for lack of a better term, have the same stripes that we have, or do we look for different stripes? You see, for too many of us, our ideological difference and even politics places a stress on the relationship that matters most to us. If you go on Facebook, you will see this play out in a very real way. I have been on there and I've seen people that I have known that have been Christians for many years and am shocked by some of the material that I see posted. It is stunning to see how people can be different in the world than they are on Sundays. <clears throat> when we listen to podcasts, when we listen to news channels, when we read newspapers or look at social media followers that are with us or people that we follow, do we like what we see and like their post? Or do we read articles that not only support our beliefs, but affirm our rightness in our beliefs? so that we are never surprised by the outcome because we already know that they believe the same thing or have the same thought that I have. When we feed our ideologies with only think like me, we have starved out a significant part of human connectedness. Different passions and convictions fuel much of the trouble outside and inside of the church. Jesus said that although we are in the world, we are not of the world. And what I take this to mean is that we should be on guard in the way we think, and we need to be on guard that the way the world thinks does not come in and permeate that which the church thinks. Have you ever heard these words, or maybe even said them to yourself? This is how I see it. That is not what I think. If you could only see it my way, then we would all be in the right place. Do we speak with each other insisting on a rightness rather than concentrating on what is common between us? You see, inevitably, our added rightness versus wrongness mentality has driven a wide wedge through God's blessed creation and leaves a deep ravine for divisiveness to take root and to take hold in our lives if we're not careful. And usually, the differences that we have, even amongst ourselves, are very small. They're often opinion, and sometimes they're hung up on tradition, like this crazy idea that Revelation was written late date, and I don't know where that came from. If we don't take time to realize that all of us have had different backgrounds and different experiences, we have different thoughts and different passions. We have different education opportunities and levels of education. We are from different ethnic and cultural backgrounds. 
If we don't think about all these things, we are robbing ourselves of how dynamic conversation can expand our own thinking when we get outside of our own rightness in the matter. We must forego the attitude of our rightness because we're trying to surpass other people's wrongness in our minds. So how do we as a local body hold together when all of these things come about? When you look at the different culture and ethnical, ethnic, ethnic, ethnicity, thank you. If we look at all the different things that take place and shape us in the church, how do we hold all of that together? Well, tonight I want to look at this idea of us together. How do you see us together? We can look at the church in Philippi and answer this question. Paul had written to them and thanked them for helping him. They had reached out to him both spiritually and financially many, many times. And throughout the book of Philippians, Paul alludes to what it was that caused the church to endure. And we need to take a look at what was holding the Philippian church together and see how we compare as a local body in the same way. The first thing we see in Philippians is that they had a salvation through Jesus Christ that held them together. In Philippians chapter 1, verses 3 through 6, we read this. I thank God, and this is Paul talking, in all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all, in view of your participation in the gospel from the very first day until now. For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work among you will complete it by the day of Christ Jesus. How can sharing the salvation offered through Jesus Christ unite and hold a group of people together? Well, the first thing we see is that salvation offers freedom from the past. In Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 18, it says, Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. I like this verse because I like this idea that I could reason the things that God has said. I can come to a conclusion based on the evidences and the things that I read that are put forth in the scriptures. We were talking about this morning's class about the Bereans and how they reasoned the scriptures daily to see if the things that Paul and Silas were talking about were so. If we think about these verses, they were originally written to the Israelites of the day, but it revealed to them that they would become righteous through a repentance if they understood that they needed to turn to God. It can also be applied to us today. You see, once we have turned to Christ and we repent of our sins and we are no longer under the hold of sin, we don't have to worry about those sins of the past. And that's a beautiful thing. There are some in here that may have sins that that you look back and you're thinking, "I, I don't know how God could ever forgive me for these things. But yet it says that God is good to forgive as long as you come to him in faith and obedience. And he washes those sins of the past out. It is true that we may still face an earthly consequence from our sins, but in God's eyes, they are washed clean. And then we can find joy by uniting with others who have turned to Christ. The next thing we see is that salvation offers purpose for the present. In Mark 16 and verse 15, he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. You see, our main purpose is to worship God and to tell others about him. To spread the gospel. To get out there and let a lost world know about the good news and the love that God has for them. And a group of believers gathering together in his name are held together by this very purpose. When we tell people to come and see, then they should see a joy and a peace that we have with each other when they come into our midst. They should see the love for each other regardless of background, regardless of ethnicity, regardless of standing in the community. They should see that all are being treated equally. The next thing we see is that salvation offers hope for the future. 
In Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6, he says, For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. When you think about this, it is a sad thing when we have people who have accepted the gospel, have turned away from the gospel. Or when we have people who have chosen, even though they have heard the good news, not to ever participate in the gospel. Because you see what happens is those individuals cannot stake a claim to a home in heaven with God if they have walked away from the very thing that's going to offer salvation to them. The Bible plainly tells us that the only way to get to heaven is through Christ. We have to accept who he is. We have to accept that he is the son of God. We have to accept his teachings, his commandments. We have to accept that he is the king of righteousness. We have to accept him and the love that he had demonstrated to us by his death, burial, and resurrection in front of us. But on the other hand, it is a joyful thing that those who have been perfected through God's grace can look forward to spending an eternity in heaven worshiping the lamb who was slain. The assurance that one day Jesus Christ will take us home to live with him gives us a tremendous hope in a dead world. It helps us to see past all of these things that are in front of us. We have a future that we can look forward to that is without sin, that is without hatred, that is without boundaries or silos or whatever you want to call them, without selfishness, without pride, All of those things will disappear when he has called us home. The next thing we see is that servanthood held the church together. In Philippians 4 and verse 10, Paul says, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lacked opportunity. So something's obviously going on with Paul And he knows that they recognized the need, but weren't able to help him in that need. If we go just a few verses farther, he says, Nevertheless, you have done well to share with me in my affliction. You see, the Philippian church took care of Paul. We don't know exactly what they did to help him, but it is clear that whatever it was that Paul needed, he went out of the way to thank them for helping him. They were there for Paul when he needed it, and they were servants in the gospel. In our Christian walk today, the spirit of servanthood can manifest itself in many ways, and I've got a few here that I want to share with you. So when we think about servanthood towards one another, there's a couple of things that we can do. First, we can bear one another's burdens. In Galatians 6 and verse 2, it says, bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. This is not a suggestion. This is not a thought. This is not an opinion. This is an imperative. We are to bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. Well, what is that law? If you remember from your studies and things that we've talked about, Jesus told the apostles in John 14 or the disciples in John 14 to love one another so that others could see that they are his disciples. That's the burden. That's the law. We are to love one another. We are to carry the load. We are to go out there and be present with one another. And folks, if we don't ever spend time with each other, we cannot bear each other's burdens. It's not possible. The Bible gives us a command to bear one another's burdens. And as Christian brothers and sisters, we have a need to be needed. We have a need for you to reach out and to communicate with us. Now, I'm going to share something with you, and I'm embarrassed to say this. I was talking to the class this morning, and I said, I want you to think about how many people did you reach out to this week? Members of the church, how many people did you exhort? How many people did you admonish? How many people did you show love to? How many people did you support? You know what my answer is? A big zero. But the whole week. And I didn't call anybody. I didn't go see anybody. I didn't have any communication with anybody. And I'm embarrassed about that. Because regardless of what life does or what gets in my way, I need to be present in the body of Christ. 
And I can't be present if I don't make myself known. So ask yourself the same question. Where are you each week? Are you able to do these things? Sometimes it's hard when you're working all week long. Sometimes it's difficult when you have families to take care of or young children to take care of or loved ones or older individuals, whatever it might be, it is tough to do. But see, the Bible doesn't qualify it and say, well, if you've got these things in front of you, then you don't have to worry about this. We are still to exhort and admonish one another to the best of our abilities. For you see, there are people in our congregation who are hurting. There are people in our congregation who need someone who is willing to bear a part of their weight, a part of the things that they are having to deal with. Now, there's a lot of times we can't come over and we can't solve a problem from a physical standpoint, but what we can do is we can offer prayer. We can offer the love towards them. We can show them that we are there to be with them. Are you willing to put yourself aside and help someone in need? The problem is, is I'm willing, but I don't do it. And that's something I have to change. But you see, it is required to hold us together. Praying for each other. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 4, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all. Take a look at what Paul does and how he does it. He makes mention that he is praying for the church at Philippi, and that every request he makes of the church is a request made out of joy. How many of us can say that we joyfully pray for one another? Or is our prayer done more out of a habit, and we just go through the words, Father, thank you for today. We're sorry these people can't be here. Let me go through the list. Let me make sure I catch everybody. want to make sure all of that's done. How much of it is a joy for us to pray for these people? How much it is that it touches our hearts when we mention their name or we think about them in that prayer? How much of it is do we really truly believe that, G- that God is listening to what we have to say on behalf of that brother or that sister? If our church or any body, physical body that's a part of the church, wants to survive, then the members must spend time in prayer for one another before an almighty God. And I don't mean to pray just when sickness or a problem comes up. In 1 Thessalonians 5.17, Paul says to pray without ceasing. Pray that we can be better teachers, leaders, fathers, mothers, children. Pray that we can be better in our spiritual maturity, that we spend time, continuous time, in our growth process before God. Pray that we have a greater desire to serve the Lord on a daily basis. Pray that nothing will come between us and our relationship with Christ our Lord. Prayer will hold us together. Loving one another. Back to Philippians. Oops, I forgot to mention that here. Philippians 1.6, it is a sad thing that those who have accepted the gospel cannot stake the claim to be in heaven, as I mentioned, but we need to understand something about prayer. In John 4, verse 7, he says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. John is talking to the church when he writes this epistle. And yet, a couple of chapters earlier, he said, The one who says he is in the light and yet hates his brother is in the darkness until now. So what does this tell us? You see, in 1 John 4, 7, he tells us to love one another, and that the fact that we are displaying that love for each other is a fact that we are born of Christ when we are doing these things for each other. But in contrast, if we hate our brother, we are showing that we are still in darkness, and we don't experience the love of Christ, nor do we have the ability to show the love of Christ You see, John is writing to the church, and so this was a problem in the church. There were those who were there who had a problem with hating a brother, somebody who they saw on a regular basis and they couldn't stand to be around. Now, this is where it gets interesting for me. I didn't choose you. I didn't. I didn't choose anyone. I didn't choose Aaron, Eric, Stephen. I didn't, I didn't choose you to be a part of this body. 
I didn't go out and say, let me just surround myself with people that I like. My personality is the same. All of the things that you do, all the things you believe in are the exact same as mine. Any more than you chose me. You're stuck with me, though. I'll just let you know. And the point of that is, in families, you're going to have disagreements. You're going to have arguments. You're going to have things that are going to happen because we don't get to choose our family. Our family is made up of people who have those different experiences and backgrounds and knowledge and so on and so forth. And so we have to be careful that we don't let our rightness get in the way of a personality disagreement or a personality challenge. Because you see, when we allow that to happen, that we are not showing the love of Christ and the love of God in our body if we allow those things to take place. If love is not present in our lives when we deal with each other, then God isn't present either when we're dealing with each other. And so if we want to make sure that when people come into this body and they see us and they see the love for each other, then we have to make sure that whatever our differences are, we are resolving. Whatever our problems are, we are resolving. Whatever our issues are, we are resolving. Because as I said, a lot of those things are really more about opinion than they are about the truth. Examine not the walk of others, but examine your own walk. That is the best thing that we can do. And we have got to make sure that there is no hate in our own hearts But in doing so, we need to take a close look at our walk with God and make sure that it is as genuine and as open and transparent as it possibly can be. In 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5, it says, Test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves. Or do you not recognize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you unless indeed you fail the test? How do you fail the test? You don't have Jesus in you. How do you not have Jesus in you? There is no love in your heart for your brother or your sister. You see, we have to make sure that we don't let the petty things get in front of us to a point where it divides us and we walk away in anger or hatred against our brother or our sister. It is important that we hold together when we love one another. Servanthood held them together because they esteemed others better than themselves. In Philippians 2.3, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. This verse kind of wraps everything together. If we bear one another's burdens, if we pray for each other, if we show genuine love among the brethren, then we can honestly say that we have placed their needs above our own. That is what being a servant is all about. A servant is there to tend to the needs of others. They cannot be thinking selfishly about themselves and then trying to tend to someone else. The only way for our church to hold together is for every member to put aside his or her selfish desire and place others' needs before their own. How did the early church do this? Well, the place where they did this and where they had a common bond and where that glue sort of held everything together and the one thing that brought great joy and unity of faith was the sharing of the communion with each other. And folks, if you aren't here, you cannot commune together. In the early church, the first day of the week services were not for the purpose to call the faithful to repentance or to make them aware of their sins. They were already in the church when they would meet. Today, we do it a little bit differently. We're calling the invitation, people who maybe are hearing the message for the first time, but they would come together and they would not, as a purpose, talk about things from the outside of people coming into the church. This was very important, but it wasn't their main reason for meeting. Their main reason for meeting was to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and they did this through a communing together. This is where the true deeper meaning of grace and love is observed in the scriptures. Matter of fact, it's where the word Eucharista comes from, the Eucharist. 
So this idea of grace and love, charis is the word for kindness and love and compassion. That was and is a service of remembrance and gratitude for God's grace upon mankind. And every first day of the week was a communion service for the early church. The communion was and should be the DNA that holds the church together. Yes, there's preaching. Yes, there's prayer. Yes, there's song. Yes, there's all these different things. But for us, we come together to commune with each other and understanding that relationship not only goes this way, but also goes this way. We can learn from our early church brothers and sisters' attitudes and understanding of why the communion service was so vitally important to them. You see, in that service, that was the time that differences would melt away. And Paul addressed that issue. There shouldn't be any relationship within the communion where someone is esteeming themselves greater than somebody else, or they're doing something that pushes out somebody else. The communion put everyone on equal footing with each other and with God. There's a story called The Story of Christianity. It's a book. And in the research that they did, they found out this information through writings and other teachings from the early church. Every Sunday was a celebration which began with giving thanks for the communion. Before taking communion, believers would offer gratitude to God, recounting at length his acts and testifying to the power of his spirit. And following the communion meal, believers shared in the second round of gratitude prayers. And after these prayers, they would move into a time of caring for one another's physical needs by taking up an offering and sharing of their resources. You see, the early church understood that focusing on God's grace in our lives through corporate gratitude is a strong unifier that places us all on a level field. And when we see us together, we will naturally take up an attitude of grace ourselves. We will be humble in heart and not worried about our rightness, but to do as Jesus did, to care for one another and look for the good in each other. We will learn to be thankful for each other. Isn't that what Jesus meant when he said that we are the light of the world, a city set on a hill? You see, the early Christians understood this. That's why they were able to hang on in the midst of a terrible, terrible persecution. And that's why the early church continued to grow and grow during this time. People seeing the light of the gospel through those early Christians. It brought people from all walks of life together, all singing praises to God, all having all things in common. Their bonds of love and their joy was sought after. Paul in the early church preached this, a gospel of grace. And they knew that if they would teach them to slow down a little bit, to choose gratitude and thank God for one another, that we would all be able to live like Christ. Ultimately, they knew that this would not only keep the peace and keep us humble, but would make a difference in the world. If you find yourself having trouble with changing your attitude to one of gratitude, I want you to think about this for a minute. Picture Jesus the night before and the day of his crucifixion. What was his attitude during this time? And what was he going through? Did he retaliate because of his rightness? Did he condemn those that beat him or spit on him? Did he seek revenge for those that drove the jagged spikes through his flesh? Did he hate those gathered before him mocking as he hung on the cross. He didn't seek revenge or retaliate against those on that day. You see, he humbled himself and did just as the Father had commanded of him, even telling us, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He fulfilled God the Father's quest to give all a way back to his presence. Of course, we're all familiar with John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. God loves us and wants the best for us. How can we not be grateful for that? 
How can we not be humble when we think about that? How can we not show the same to all that we come into contact with? What if we express gratitude for one another? What if we said words of thanks, wrote words of thanks, prayed words of thanks for others? You see, the psalmist understood this, understood the power of gratitude, which is why he told us that the entrance into the gates of the Lord was through words of thanksgiving and songs of praise. And in Psalm 100, we read this, Shout joyfully to the Lord all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful singing. Know that the Lord himself is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his loving kindness is everlasting, and his faithfulness is to all generations. You know, it is my prayer that we all learn to humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord and give thanks and express gratitude to God and for each other. And putting away our urge to always be right and always having things go our way. And may we concentrate on all that we have in common, not just on the few things that might be of opinion and could potentially separate us because of those opinions. God set us free to love and share gratitude and to share joy with each other. But you see, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But through the cross of Christ and his resurrection, God has brought us back And he did so by bringing us to our knees. Jesus calls us. Though many will come to him, not everybody will stay with him. People will get tied up in their own thoughts, their own minds, their own selfishness, their own pride. And they will forget what it is to be loved and understanding what God did for them. And therefore they cannot share that with other people. But he calls us to become one in love, to be caring for each other, to be in spirit with each other, to be united in gratitude for what he has done for us. So when you think about this body, this group of people right here, where do we stand today? Are we united in thought? Are we united in deed? Do we take the time to show that love and adoration for each other Not just because someone is in need, but just because it's the right thing to do. Where will this body be 10 years from now, 20 years from now? Will we be able to stand the test of time? It's up to us. How can we make a difference in how things go here at Sun Garden? Because at the end of the day, it's us together that makes that difference. Think about how you can make a difference. Because it's up to you to help make that difference. Of course, if you haven't had the opportunity to become a child of God, the opportunity is here for you. God loves you. He has done everything that he can do to bring that plan to full fruition, to bring you into a right relationship with him. But it's an action that you have to take. And I'm talking about an action that requires steps. Not one of just saying, can Jesus come into my heart and everything is okay? Or let me send a thousand dollars to Gil and everything will be fine. (laughs) It's not how it works. But we need to understand that if we want to have that relationship, we need to be fully committed to him. And that means starting out by becoming a child of God by being baptized in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ our Lord, as he demonstrated to us physically, so too we demonstrate our love by doing the same. Or if you're here tonight and you are struggling with anything in your life, maybe you yourself are struggling as I am, by communicating, by getting out there and exhorting one another, Maybe you're having difficulty that isn't physical in nature, but maybe it's spiritual. Maybe there is something just eating away at you and you need the help of this congregation. For you see, folks, it's not just about coming here, sitting for an hour, and then going home. It's
It's about identifying when you're struggling to let your family, let your brothers and sisters know how they can help you. And we will rise up together and pray for you and help you in a time of need. If either of these things be the case for you tonight, I ask that you come forward while we stand and while we 